Let's take our Bibles and look again in Ezekiel chapter 28. My text for this reading and commentary is from verse 16 down to verse 26. Last time we considered how the king of Tyre, which was a mighty king back in the day, up in what we know today as Lebanon, north of Israel, and yet we've been seeing how God prophesied that all of these surrounding kings around Israel would also be brought to naught when Nebuchadnezzar would be given the power to come into the land and not only destroy Jerusalem but everything in the way. He had no power, even though he was a wicked king, but what God gave him had power. So we continue to see this comparison, really, between the king of Tyre and Satan himself. That's the type we're seeing here. So beginning with verse 16, it says, By the multitude of of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy thee notice here O covering cherub so even though he's talking about the king of Tyre yet it's related back to the very spirit of Satan who was animating the king of Tyre. There are really only two spirits in the world. There's a spirit of Antichrist and the spirit of Christ. Anything that's not the spirit of Antichrist, you know is the spirit of Antichrist. And here he's described as being under the influence of Satan himself, that covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, and I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. So here we see again this comparison, the pride and iniquity of the king of Tyre. You could take a piece of paper and put him on one side and then put the comparison with Satan on the other, and it's everything that Satan is such as the evil of men's hearts who are subject to Satan and his power. Here it speaks of the abundance of their merchandise. By the abundance of the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And he says, thou hast sinned. Because Satan is spoken of here as the king of Tyre, we saw that, you see in verse 15, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So that theme is continued here. That God spoke, spoke of Satan's sins in the same terms as Tyre's sins. I know people like to say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, you're of the same spirit as the devil, such as the depravity of the heart. So Satan is spoken of here as the king of Tyre, and Tyre was a highly commercialized city-state. See, this is the thing when you study these scriptures, there's historic truth, reality, and then there's spiritual application. Tyre was a highly commercialized city-state focused only on winning a profit. Does that sound a little bit like some other countries we know? Nothing's changed over the years. But Satan's abundance of trading. So this is where I say you could take and draw a line, do some comparison here. 
it was found in his competitive spirit and his desire to be exalted above that of even the throne of God. And were we really studying down through this exposition, we'd go over to uh, Isaiah chapter 14. You can just make a note, Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. Both Isaiah and Ezekiel use the same comparison. One with the king of Tyre, one with the king of Babylon. But the same comparison. The abundance of your trading. These were dishonest business practices of the leaders of Tyre. We talk about corrupt leaders. Well, ever since the fall, they've been around. And who brought the fall? Satan himself. So the leaders of Tyre here were a reflection of the dishonest, deceptive dealings of the spiritual power behind them. There's an evil spirit behind every corruption of men and leadership. Satan, Christ said, is the father of lies. So when you have leaders that are lying, guess what? He's the father of lies. And he comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what Christ said there in John 10. So the reference to trade here in Ezekiel 28 shows that there is a blend of the king of Tyre and his master. In other words, Satan himself. I imagine you, cause, you could cause quite a stir in uh, places of power, whether it's Washington, D.C. or anywhere in the world, and every corrupt decision that comes forth, you tell them you're under the influence of Satan. Boy, they would not like to hear that, but that's the reality. The connection here between Tyre and Satan shows that the devil is just as much in the business of commercial outworkings of men as he is in armies and war. And again, this is the Lord that gives these over to his power to do with them what he will. That's why it says you became filled with violence in the midst, you were filled in the midst of thee with violence there in verse 16. Satan's desire from the beginning was to exalt himself above even the throne of Christ. And we can see that when Christ came in the flesh, how Satan attacked him with what? Violence. Even to the point of pursuing him to the cross, never realizing that that was God's purpose all along. Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know all things. A lot of people attribute that to him, but that belongs to God alone. I don't believe he even knows who the elect are. He only discovers in time as the spirit does a work of grace in the heart and therefore begins his attack against such that have their eyes turned to Christ. But even with violence as Satan sought to overthrow the throne of Christ, this is all before the foundation of the world. So in time, that violence is reflected through these different kings that are raised up. And uh, they, these kings rejected God's authority, even as Christ, did, as, uh, Satan did. And so with violence, he pursues any that he wills and directs so as, as God gives them over to him. But that's why it says there, therefore, in verse 16, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I believe this speaks of the expulsion of Satan from heaven. And that this is something that the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke of in Luke 10, 18. When they were questioning his authority and he said, that he had seen Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He said that because they were questioning who he was as God. And uh, just like he said before Abraham was I am and they mocked him. You're not, only, you're not even 52 years old and you, know, you say you know Abraham. <laughs> we imagine here when he declares that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's when he was cast out. 
That's what it's speaking of. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, just as he had done with Satan, so he would do with the king of Tyre. Why? Because your heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. See that in verse 17? The key there is old covering cherub. He was an angel that Christ had created and for a while served him, but then in time rebelled and was cast out of heaven. Why? Because his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. Satan's sin, just like any sin since the fall, was prompted by what? Pride. And with a swelled heart, drunk on his own sense of beauty and splendor, he opposed God. And that's really how people today that are under his dominion as unconverted sinners. Now, some may be those that are elect and that Christ has redeemed, and yet until the time that the Spirit draws them, they are under the influence of Satan as much as anybody that's demon-possessed. That's how Paul wrote to Timothy there in 2 Timothy 4. If peradventure God grant repentance to these and deliver them who all their lifetime were under the bondage of, of Satan. But men are lifted up with the same pride and look at themselves as being somewhat before God, assuming they have some beauty and splendor in their works righteousness, but it's, it's nothing but filthy rags. And so, verse 17, he says, I will cast thee to the ground. There again, I laid you before kings. Satan's fall was in many ways public and dramatic. Why? Because we're still talking about it today. Even though it took place before the foundation of the world, where does he appear on the scene of history? Back there in the garden, confronting the first man that Christ created. But that again, God purposed. There's nothing that takes place here but what God has purposed it. But it's given us the, the picture here, the comparison. Just as Satan's fall was public and dramatic, so would be Tyre's fall. And I know we're talking about a city that means nothing to us today because it doesn't exist anymore. God completely wiped it out. But back in the day, it was prominent. And uh, the world took note when Tyre fell, just as we take note concerning the judgment of Satan when he fell. And I will say in the end, we'll take note when he is ultimately cast into everlasting fire. He says here that you defiled the sanctuaries. And... There, again, by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading, is what that's speaking of there in verse 18. The focus of trying to win profit that ultimately corrupted and eventually ruined Tyre. That's what Satan is about today. Men's souls claiming who he can, who he will. But our comfort is in knowing, as Christ said, I will build my church and what the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ has those that he has redeemed and he will indeed keep. And Satan, though violent in seeking to keep Christ from drawing them to himself, they're already his, already Christ. But he says here, the king of Tyre, you've become a horror. And even Ezekiel, records that the nations would be horrified by the judgment, not only of Tyre here, but ultimately of Satan himself. So this, even as Tyre's prophecy was fulfilled, we look at it as being fulfilled. You say, well, what about Satan? Right now, he's going about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
God has purposed that, but I will tell you, he's on a chain. He's not free to go where he will. And we know that from Revelation chapter 20. He's bound today. He's limited. He can only deceive those that are his anyway and not the Lord's. Christ said, my sheep hear my voice. A stranger they will not follow. Maybe when we're born in this world, we follow after Satan's devices and false religion. And, but if the Lord has paid our debt, he's going to call us. That's why we're here today. And that's why we don't fear Satan. I grew up where you had to have Bible verses at the ready whenever Satan came to tempt you. And you had a Bible verse for every temptation. I had a big old box of those index cards and you'd keep them handy in your pocket and they were all they were all divided up by temptation and so you'd quickly go there and then you'd recite these things like a mantra the verse not knowing that Satan had already been defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ he's the one that crushed his head there at the cross that's where our deliverance is so verses 20 to 23, again, this prophecy against Sidon, which would be, you, know, you hear Tyre and Sidon. Those are two cities that were prominent back there in the day. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, verse 21, Son of man, set thy face against Zidon, or Sidon, and prophesy against it, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee. O Zidon, and I will be glorified in the midst of thee, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall have exercised or executed judgments in her, and shall be sanctified in her. For I will send into her pestilence and blood into her streets, and the wounded shall be judged in the midst of her by the sword upon her on every side, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Who sends this? Not Satan. Satan would gladly have kept Tyre and Zidon prospering against God. But here it says, verse 23, I will send into her pestilence. This is a God that the world doesn't know. Everybody's trying to figure out where that COVID virus came from and the origin and everything. I know. God sent it. Because that's what it says here. I will send into her what? Pestilence. That's what that word is. That's not, not anything new. And then blood in her streets. What's that? War. All of these things come from the hand of God. I know we got a bunch of preachers running around saying, oh, God, never do that. Well, you don't know God. It's right here in the, in the Bible. Underscore it. And so the city of Sidon was another Phoenician harbor. Remember Phoenicia? They came from the Greeks up the Aegean Sea, and they settled down in this area. And uh, God, therefore, had a word of judgment to speak against them. You say, by what right does he have to speak? Isn't he the God of Israel? He's a God of all the nations. Zidon was a great city, and even in Joshua's time. You can read about it in uh, Joshua 11, 8, 19, 28. It was built by Zidon, actually one of Canaan's sons, in Genesis 10 and verse 15, and became a very famous mart for all types of merchants, like Tyre, full of sin, has riches. In Ezekiel's day, Zidon was not a very important state in comparison with Tyre, its neighbor, but nonetheless, even though it seemed insignificant, Yet it was to be targeted by the Lord. I am against you. It says, O Zidon, I will be glorified in your midst. Glorified how? In your condemnation. So much for God being a God of love and wanting everybody to be saved. And he wouldn't hurt a flea. Read your Bible. I am against you. People aren't even troubled in hearing those words. But God is against any sinner, no matter how great in the eyes of men for whom Christ did not pay the sin debt left to themselves justly so God is against them this is the declaration 
that he would glorify himself in Zidon. Glorify how? By their condemnation. There's some that want to argue, well, God would never send sinners to hell. He really wants to save them, but he will if he has to. No. He's glorified even in the condemnation of sinners. His justice, his holiness. And so the fulfillment of this prophetic word actually is recorded in Nebuchadnezzar's court registry. He mentions the king of Sidon along with other notables that were conquered. So there, it's not that we need those extra biblical records to confirm the scriptures, but the scriptures rather confirm what occurred in history. But here, in the midst of all this, verse 24, we see God blessing Israel, even in the judgments that were to come upon the neighboring nations. It says in verse 24, And there shall be no more a prickling briar under the house of Israel, nor any grieving thorn of all that are round about them that despise them, and they shall know that I am the Lord God. What's he talking about? A remnant that he would preserve. Even though there was a, a, a when it says a pricking briar, that's a dry briar all around that is easily set on fire, but the Lord would preserve this remnant and uh, they would know that I am the Lord God. See how many times that's repeated? I am the Lord God. And there in verses 25 and 26 then is a promise to restore Israel, which God did. Remember Ezekiel was already in exile. And when we read this 25 and 26, don't be thinking of anything future. A lot of people like to take this and relate it to 1948 and when Israel's brought back and now God's restoring. You think that time between 1948 and today, Israel is still as wicked as it ever was. But here the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered. Well, who's that speaking of? That's when they were taken into captivity, time of Babylon. And shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen. Then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. Did they come back? Yes, Cyrus gave the decree to go back. Did they rebuild? Yes. Was the temple rebuilt? Yes. Was Jerusalem rebuilt? Yes. So that's when this prophecy was fulfilled. And they shall dwell safely therein and shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God. All we have to do is look back and see how God was faithful exactly to do what he said he would do. Not only in condemning the nations round about them, but preserving a remnant that he brought back and put back in the land. Why did he do that? Well, because Christ still had not yet come. He was to come from that seed of Judah. And uh, it was several hundred years later that that was fulfilled in his coming. What a glorious word we have to read here. It's like reading the newspaper. You read it, you compare what we see going on today in the world. And the one thing we can conclude, how many times it's said here is, the Lord said, I am the Lord their God. He's a God of nations. He's a God of his people. Blessed be his name. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. How precious that we can go through it verse by verse. But how we need your spirit to give us understanding. And I pray that you'd be our teacher at all times. I pray that you would bless the continuation of our time of worship to your honor and glory alone and that of your son. And we give you the praise and glory in his precious name. Amen.